Hi, it's Richard from Racing Profits. We're just with Peter Webb and we're just discussing about trading. This is part two of the trading video. Um, Give it a try. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the blog, uh, which is at blog.betangel.com, um, you'll get a, a view on what I'm doing at any one time, mm. what sports I'm involved in, how things are going. Mm. And every now and again, I'll throw up a screenshot of, of, of a big race that I've done. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you get good and bad races and so on. But I think when you get confident, um, you sort of can sort of really go for it and, and pull out some good results now. Yeah. Right? It would be nice to believe that every race was like that, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, I saw your but screenshot a... of the Royal Hunt Cup. That was a, a nice trade on that. It's £650 profit on that. Yeah, when, when the markets line themselves up well and you're ready for them, then yeah, um, yeah. you can you can pick off some absolutely fantastic opportunities. Fabulous. Okay, well that's great. So let's um, talk a bit about your trading mentality then. When you trade, obviously you're building up a pot of money. Mm -hmm. Do you then leave that on the favourite or do you always green up across all the horses in the race? The, if you look at the way that the market um, manifests itself, you know that you know, mm. your third of favourites win and so on. Yeah, yeah. And um, the problem that you have if you don't green up is that you maybe have had a really great race and you've earned a few hundred pounds, yeah. um, and then you leave it running on the favourite and mysteriously he doesn't win. Yeah, yeah. And then on the next race you maybe make five or ten pounds and you suddenly realise there's a huge way yeah. to get back. So um, whether I've made or lost money, I will green or red up. Yeah. Okay. And what that allows me to do is it gives me a consistent staking plan that I can build my stakes and grow things from there. Yeah. And I think you demonstrated that quite you know, quite succinctly yesterday when you were saying that, you know, out of 10 trades, you only need to have five or six to make profit to yeah. always be making profit through the day. So Yeah, and that's that's one of the, the, the sort of tricks. Some of the numbers and the figures that you see and the, the winning runs you go on are huge, mm -hmm. but it's because you're doing so many of them. Yeah, And as long right. as you know that you're generally up yeah. overall, then you can continue to do as many as you possibly can and, and hopefully you, you should continue to end up. Because what amazed me was your return on investment so low, isn't it, really, as a percentage? You're looking about 0.25% or yeah. to 0.5. I think you said you maybe get above 0.5 after so many years doing it. But uh, Yeah, I mean, you're talking tenths of a percent, really. Mm. So it's somewhere between zero and tenths of a percent So yeah. um, on your total turnover. So that's why it's a shock for traditional gamblers, because they're happy to put £10 down to win 1000 Yeah. And a trader's happy to put 1000 down to win 10 Or 100000 to win. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there, there is a big difference in, in terms of the amount of money that you use and, and how you use it in the market. But it's the volume that a trader puts through the market and his percentage, small percentage on that volume, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you know, I think, you know, now and again there's a bit of controversy about our traders working in the market and so on. But in fact, for the amount of liquidity they provide, they, you know, it's a very small percentage of mm. return mm. on that liquidity yeah, that, yeah. That, that they can ever possibly get. And, yeah. and there's always risk involved. So the message there is always plan to make small profits but consistently. Yeah, you won't you won't make enormous amounts and sometimes when you look at the blog and you see a huge amount from me, yeah. that's just because I put an awful lot of money through the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it isn't a reflection on some wonderful trade where I've happened to catch So your people, it. people have got a way to get to you over years, not in months and... Yeah, and the way I did it was I started at a very, very low base level. Mm. I think I funded my account with a thousand pounds and just chipped away at it. Um, small inconsistency. There's, there's over 10,000 races a year. Mm. So even if you only earn a pound or two a race, that's still a lot of money. A lot of money. And I think it's perfectly possible for yeah. somebody to earn a pound or two a race. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you, know, yeah, you showed that yesterday and I think that's you know, quite capable. You know, and, and like you say, even in the summer when there's only 40 races a day, you know, if you were coming out with 80, 100 pounds out of those races, you know, that would be a, a decent day and cover everything else you were doing in the day. Yeah, so I don't think it's, you know, it's an unreasonable expectation. No. And what about in running? Let's talk a little bit about in running because um, it's something that I know people out there do. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get involved in running at all or do you steer clear about it? Is it too volatile? Yeah, I think the problem is, there's the, uh, you know, you will be able to tell me um, which course has a hill in the runner. I know Sandanders because I've been there. Yeah. I've walked up the hill from the train station. Yeah, it's like toaster, <laughs> the finish at toaster, you know, you can tell yeah. the horses can get very short and then suddenly they just totally run out of steam up that hill. So. Yeah, so you know, I'm I'm not clever enough or have enough specialist knowledge mm -hmm. to know um, all of those courses and which horses run particularly well mm -hmm. at those courses. Or you know, I it's it's funny actually because having watched so many races mm -hmm. uh, one day, I just you know blurted out, "He's won it!" Yeah, and I suddenly realised that I was actually beginning to interpret 
the information in front of me, yeah, and I could see if the horse was off the bridle, if the jockey was struggling, if the horse was struggling. Just from the price fluctuations. Well, just from watching it and seeing yeah. how the market was reacting to yeah. the activity. Um, but I still think that there are many better people than me out there. Mm. Um, at the the problem you have, I think, is the information you're getting is, is going to be about 20 seconds behind anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, I know from visiting tracks that there's people who rent rooms just overlooking the track <laughs> so they're so. perfectly live. Yeah, so I think that you know you'd have to be quite skilled anyway to do it. Mm. Um, but also, there's no edge for me there. No. Um, maybe there's a statistical one that I haven't found yet. Yeah. Um, and I will keep looking. So, so. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it's in a market I don't really participate in that much. No, no. I think trading pre-race is always the safest thing. And I, you know, I always feel more comfortable getting out. Yeah. A minute before the off, rather than letting it go in running. I mean, during the national hunt season, for example, mm. and here's an in running trade that I will do. Mm. Um, if I've made profit on the race, then it's free for me to do whatever I wish. Yeah. So very often I'll dutch the runners at the back of the field. Oh, right. yeah. um, and the intention there is if you have two or three fallers, yeah. especially if they're at the front, yeah. the odds on other horses will fall dramatically. And you will end up. And you'll trade off then when they fall. Yeah. Mm. And you know, over the last few years, I've, I've bagged a few thousand winners. Yeah. Um, using that strategy, simply because a loose horse has got in the way of the favourite, brought that down, brought the second favourite down. Yeah. And then a horse that was priced at five hundred or something has come through to win. Yeah. Or shortened dramatically in price. So that that's you know a fairly sensible low risk mm. strategy that doesn't involve a huge amount of skill. No. I know there's a, a, a very successful strategy in, in short flat races, five and six furlong races, uh, where you lay the field at 1.4 yeah. um, and, and you'll nearly always find that three or four horses will hit that figure. Um, so then you're obviously betting on the multiples of that um, and it's such a small risk for what you make on them. Uh, and, but it only works again for very specific races, you know, usually handicap, short, short handicaps that works very well on. Yeah, you know, I'm fascinated by the in-running side of things and, mm. um, and there's plenty of work that I will do on it, just mm. so you know, I'd like to come up with a model yeah. of, of in running, but okay. I'm still somewhere from that at the moment. Okay, well, what we'll do is we'll finish up the trading um, interview part of the interview there. I think we've covered most things to do with trading there. I don't think there's any other questions I really wanted to ask you on that. Um, the one thing was obviously uh, the major meetings that we haven't spoken about. Now, you find those as the best trading opportunities, don't you? Um, is that liquidity wise or is it the more stable markets, the level of the horse? Yeah, I th I th the markets do tend to be more stable simply because they're better researched. Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't tend to find uh, the sort of moves that you'd find on a Barney Cody horse on a Wednesday evening at Wolverhampton. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the price of horses tends to be a bit more stable, which means that you can afford to take more risk. Right. Yeah. So, you tend to use very large multiples of your uh, standard staking. Yeah, yeah. at the large meetings because you know you can get away with it and the liquidity is there. Is that, yeah. um, but it brings other problems in that because there's so many people in the market and liquidity is higher, mm. you have to adapt your trading style a bit. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You end up having to raise your stakes significantly to do that. But when it works, it works spectacularly well. Yeah, and there's a, a lot of money on the favourites in those as well, isn't there? On both sides of the fence. So. Yeah, you can get 30, 40 grand yeah. on either side. So yeah. you know, you're know you going to be sat at the back of an enormous queue waiting for, to waiting for something to it's happen. It's not quite as instant, is no. it? But you know, on the, on the flip side, if you get um, uh, a low grade race with a, a big gamble on it, then they can produce significant moves as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. So you know, there, there's a, a strategy for every market. Right. Um, but I do tend to like the big markets because they can throw up decent opportunities. Now. Definitely, yeah, I think so too. Um, right, well, we'll finish there on the trading side and then we'll move on to Bet Angel itself, the software and how we develop that and really what you, you know, were looking to do when you developed Bet Angel. Okay. Okay, thank you very much.